So, um, ham radio's changed an awful lot since 1968 when he was one, by the way. Um, <laughs> my first radio was a crystal controlled 75 watt transmitter and a very nice HF receiver. Uh, these days, first rigs look a lot more like this because uh, especially these days, uh, not this one, but others are quite cheap. They're, uh, uh, they don't require you to string wires between trees or ask your dad permission to climb on the roof to run a coax like I had to do. Yeah. Um, so uh, we end up with a lot of folks that have a lot of capability in their hand, but there's also some complexity. So, so which has a more complex protocol, this or this? The phone or the radio? The, 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 phone, the phone has an incredibly complex uh, uh, protocol. It's, you know, it, it jumps around to different frequencies. It automatically associates and tunes to effectively repeaters. Um, this is a lot simpler, but we can really work this pretty easy. <laughs> Can't work this uh, sometimes because you have to, uh, we're in control of the infrastructure for this, whereas we pay Verizon or AT&T to do all the provisioning for this. Uh, that's, what makes, that's what makes us different as hams. So what's the, what's the purpose of a radio communication? Let's say you're at a, a public service event or an emergency drill or something like that. And you, you push the push to talk and, and you talk into it. The, what's the purpose of what? <laughs> Well, it's to transfer information. If you don't have anything, if you don't have any information, uh, well, I guess hams do talk a lot. They engage in what I call high bandwidth, low data rate communications. Um, but the idea is to get something from your brain to another person's brain and get it there effectively and reliably. So it's a pretty perilous journey for that, for that information. First of all, it has to get from your brain to your mouth, and your mouth has to be working, and they need to be connected. The brain and the mouth need to be connected. Then it has to get to the microphone on your radio. Then the radio does some stuff to it, turns it into RF energy with the audio encoded on it. And then the magic part happens, which to me has always just amazed me. Um, typically, you put out some energy into the air on your antenna, and, and on average, about one one hundred millionth of that power gets from the transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna. But it still manages to work. And, and what does it need in between? Nothing. In fact, the less that's there, the better. Uh, so anyway, it arrives at an antenna, one one hundred millionth of that energy does, gets turned back into sound, comes out of speaker, goes in your ear, the other person's ear, and then to that person's brain. Sorry, thank you, thank you for uh, pointing that out. Okay, so what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, actually, it turns out quite a few things. Um, first of all, the brain's not working. Um, so, so, yeah, you can have cranial gas, so. Um, can I plug this into your computer? You can plug whatever you, it's not my computer, so. I hope it has viruses and stuff for, for Brendan. Uh, turn it over. I think you have it upside down. There you go. Yeah. No, you were. Keep talking. All right. Oh, and it's, yeah, that was a display port you were trying to put it in. Keep talking. <laughs> what could go wrong? What could go wrong, yeah. All right. Now we're cooking. Uh, we're, we're introducing technology in the middle of the right. presentation. Okay. There you go. All right. Now so, be alert. Think before you speak. Thinking is a necessary part of ham radio. Uh, be brief and clear. All right. Speak to be heard. Get your microphone close to your uh, mouth and speak in a clear relatively loud voice. Don't shout, but don't mumble. Okay, 
Stay away from noisy places. If there's a lot of noise around you, you're not going to be heard. Stay an inch or two away from your microphone. Know where the microphone is on your radio. It makes a difference. Um, it really does. I mean, look, study your radio and see if you can figure out where on the front panel the microphone is because they're all over the map depending on where it is. This, this one happens to have a little hole right down here. This one has a little hole right here. Some of the, uh, the Chinese radios have such a tiny hole that very little sound gets through and it sometimes requires a little bit of a drill bit to open it up a little bit. Uh, okay, the radio can be broken, battery dead. Uh, uh, something isn't set right. Keep your batteries charged, have a spare. Um, use your radio often. Fool with it, it's a toy, have fun. Uh, see if you can make it uh, do things that you didn't, weren't able to do with it yesterday. Um, also, ask people how you sound when you talk to them, and if somebody asks you for a signal report, give an honest one, right? If they're mad at you because you say that they don't, you can't understand them or it's weak or scratchy, then they're not a true ham. A true ham is always trying to improve their uh, station. Be honest with signal reports. You could be too far away. Remember, the ether, which is the nothing that radio tra travels through, has three things it care about. Near is better than far, high is better than low, and outside is better than inside. Now, you don't always have control over all those things, but improve what you can. Also, use as much power as you can afford. And by afford, I mean how, how much capacity does your battery have. Uh, don't waste it. There could be too much loud noise at the other end. Stay away from loud places. Have headphones. Make sure they work. I don't know how many times I've been in an activation or something and somebody takes out their radio and then they take out what used to be like a Radio Shack bag and they're ripping it open, trying out their headphones when they actually need them. Okay? This goes to playing with a radio uh, before, you, uh, uh, before you have to use it. What most of this I'm going to talk about is, and that trips people up is that something isn't set right. Um, there's some things that are not obvious to a new ham as that can inhibit your radio's ability to communicate. So know how to work it. Practice and prepare. Remember, it's a toy. You got to play with it frequently. Okay, so here's your seven steps to success. Uh, okay, you probably all know this one. Turn it on. <laughs> Make sure you know how. I mean, uh, it's real easy, for instance, with this radio, if you push the button one too many times to actually lock it. Sometimes the, the power button uh, is used to actually lock the controls on the radio and you won't be able to figure out why you can't change the channel. Make sure your battery's charged. Set the right frequencies and modes. We're going to talk about that in the rest of the presentation. Listen. Always listen before you talk. Why? Somebody else might be using the frequency. You don't want to jump in. Uh, well, that's the thinking part. <laughs> Listen and think, right? It gives you your best shot. You could only listen to one half of the conversation. True. Push the push to talk button. And one thing that uh, some new hams have tr trouble with is they start talking as they push the button. There's a lot of electronic stuff that has to happen between when you push the push to talk button and when the signal actually gets to the radio at the other end. Give it a half a second or so. Push the push to talk button. Give it a, a little bit of a pause before you start talking or otherwise everybody will be missing your first syllable or two. Talk clearly. Use English. It's usually a common language. And the harder you try to sound cool, usually the worse it gets. Just speak like you're talking to uh, somebody in a conversation, because that's really what you're doing. Then you need to release the push to talk. <laughs> Very important step. Otherwise, you will not be able to hear what people are uh, coming back to you with. And they can't talk. And if it's a repeater, you'll be tying it up. And you're also killing your battery. And you're also killing your battery, right, for no apparent reason. Um, and then you just go to step three. So that's the, uh, uh, that's the algorithm that you use when you're communicating on one of these radios or pretty much any local VHF uh, radio. So let's talk about setting the right frequencies and mo modes because 
that trips people up. Oh, and oh, by the way, the most important step is step three. It really is. So what's the big deal? Well, first thing is we need to uh, uh, deal with the ether. We need to deal with getting that at least 100 millionth of our power to the other end. Um, so everybody, you know, you get a new radio and you show it to your buddies or your family or your friends. They say, wow, how far can you talk with that thing? Everybody wants to know how far you can talk with that thing. And the only answer you can give them honestly is it depends, because it depends on an awful lot of things. Handheld radios talking directly to each other are kind of a worst case situation. You have a little bit of a crippled antenna, right? It's a little tiny antenna. It's not very efficient. You're, you've got limited power because you're running off a battery. You're on the ground. You're often indoors. It's pretty much a worst case situation. So repeaters can help us there as they are helping us right now. Listen to other people talk. Um, but you need to do a little bit more work. If you're talking to a buddy and directly handheld to handheld, all you got to do is put yourself on the same simplex frequency. Yeah, you know, 147.48 on both ends, no repeater offset, you're done. You're talking. Repeaters need a little bit more work. So remember what we said, near better than far, higher, high is better than low, outside better than inside. <coughs> All these apply to both ends. If, if only one end can get up high in the clear, use more power, uh, then that will really help. So that's what a repeater is. It's got a nice outside antenna that's up high, and it's got a, usually a pretty powerful transmitter. So you can talk to your local repeater as we are from even indoors here with uh, low power uh, handhelds but there's nobody at the repeater. <laughs> so how does that help us? The repeater acts like a middleman. It listens on one frequency and retransmits at the same time, the same signal on a different frequency. So you have to do a little bit of work to configure your radios to listen and transmit on the same, uh, on the proper frequencies for the repeater. So here's a repeater. It's a nice little green box with an antenna sticking out the top. Uh, and there's a sender and a receiver. Uh, both of them are handheld radios. So what happens is the sender transmits, goes, hits the antenna, goes to a receiver inside the repeater. The receiver lets the controller know that somebody's transmitting. The controller lets the transmitter know that I need to re resend this information. It goes out usually the same antenna, which is kind of an amazing thing, um, and then to the receiver. Okay, receives a signal in it, on its input, the controller detects someone sending, activates the transmitter, the transmitter sends the, sends the same audio at the same time. But it uses a different frequency. Why does it use a different frequency? Well, notice they're using the same antenna, right? <laughs> if your transmitter is putting out 100 watts on 147.48 megahertz, and your receiver is tuned to that, and there's no... There's no way you can filter that out. It's just you're going to see a little mushroom cloud and the receiver will disappear. So what it does is what I don't show here is there's a filter in here that separates the transmit frequency from the receive frequency in a very, very efficient way. It's called a duplexer. They're pretty amazing uh, works of art that, uh, that get that done. So let's pretend we have a repeater that's receiver is tuned to 146.04. At VHF, there's usually a 0.6 megahertz or 600 kilohertz offset between the two. Um, so the so if you want to listen to the repeater, you got to listen to 146.64, and if you want to send to it, you got to transmit it on 146.04. You notice the if you can read that 146.64 is in the uh, radio, and then if you hit the push to talk button on that same radio, it automatically shifts to 146.04. That's all done for you automatically if you configure it correctly. Okay, a couple of uh, ways to refer to repeater. Generally, you refer to repeater by its output frequency, the one that you listen to or the one that it's transmitting on. That's what you dial into your radio if you want to listen to the repeater. Uh, I'm, oh, I mentioned uh, the offset is the difference between the input frequency and its output. 
And on two meter readers, the off offset is generally uh, 600 kilohertz or 0.6 megahertz. There's also a standard agreements for whether that 600 is above or below uh, the input frequency. And uh, I won't go into that there. Most radios actually handle that automatically for you as well and, and usually get it right. <laughs> uh, so what do repeaters look like? This is a very dated photo. I have, I have updated this. This is what the 145.31 repeater used to look like the last time I was up there. It was an old GE Progline uh, commercial radio. It's now, I think, a Yesu Fusion um, that they put up there with, with no amplifier. This is the, uh, the venerable 146.70 repeater that uh, WA4TXE owns and has uh, limped along for several years. Most of this equipment isn't functional. <laughs> uh, like this exciter right here, you know, anybody recognize that? That's no longer being used. So anyway, it's gradually being, it's like the bionic man. It's getting transistor uh, replacements in there, but it's, it's always on the air. It always seems to work. It's a pretty amazing thing. But, they're made to uh, last and perform and not look pretty in general. Uh, and these both qualify. <laughs> so how do you set the offset? Well, if you have a Baofeng radio, you go to your wonderful instruction manual. <laughs> uh, so that, that's something that's one of the problems with some of the Chinese radios don't have great instruction manuals. So you're uh, you're going to get stuck with it. Fortunately, there is a Chinese radio documentation project out there, which you can Google and you can find uh, much better uh, descriptions of how those radios work. They're not great. They're not as good as the, the kind of the higher end radio manuals, but at least you have a shot at figuring it out. So I'm not going to go into exactly how to do that. We'll probably have one on one sessions, I guess, later on um, to uh, to kind of uh, walk you through how to do that with your radio. So how do you can, can you tell if it's uh, set? Uh, this is something I gave a presentation I prepared for people using Baofeng. So all the examples are, uh, are that. So um, with the Baofeng, you go to Shift D and uh, you go to the offset of 0.6 megahertz. And you can tell it's set when the 146.64 is showing here. And you see the minus, you know that when you transmit, it's going to go down 600 kilohertz to 04. And uh, for the 443 repeater where the offset is positive, you'll see a plus sign. So something like that will be on your radio if you see it. Okay, so that's great if there's no tone squelch involved. So tone squelch is the next thing I want to cover because I've seen this trip uh, a lot of people up in the field. So what if two repeaters are on the same frequency? They're mostly separated, but if you're halfway in between them, and you're transmitting, you're probably going to get into both. So what uh, happens is um, you, you end up annoying the people the, on the people uh, on the repeater you're not talking to. You end up hearing half of a conversation because uh, maybe the person that he's talking to on that other repeater can't hit the one that you're listening to. Um, so tone squelch was introduced for this. It wasn't invented by hams. It was uh, invented by commercial radio for dispatchers like taxi dispatchers so that um, taxi, dis uh, taxi drivers uh, w would only listen to um, radio signals coming to them or intended for them uh, when they uh, had their microphone hung up on the, um, on the dash. It's called PL, which stood for a private line. I think that was a Kenwood. Is it Kenwood had that for a trade name? Motorola, okay, I get Kenwood, Motorola, all the same, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and CTCSS, which is continuous tone coded squelch, subaudible squelch. Sub continuous tone coded squelch system. system. Okay. Anyway, uh, you'll see it referred to a, uh, by a lot of different handles like that. So, tone squelch basics. What? Uh, how does it work? Well, the, inside the repeater controller, uh, instead of when the receiver receives a signal, it automatically turning on the transmitter, it it uh, throws another little hurdle in there, and that is that it needs to hear uh, a very low uh, frequency uh, audio tone uh, or else it doesn't activate the transmitter. I mean, you could be getting into the full strength into the repeater. You'd be standing right next to it. You won't activate the transmitter unless you have that tone uh, kind of riding on your audio. 
Uh, once again, go to your manual. Uh, good luck if you have a Baofeng. Um, these are the... Or, or a TYT. Yeah. Yeah. Those are there. I think they're made about 20 miles. Um, so these are the actual frequencies. I apologize. It's so small. But it's really interesting. I think the highest frequency is 254.1 hertz. So these are very precise frequencies. It's pretty amazing that you can, first of all, generate something that precisely and that the re repeater can filter it out that precisely. The lowest one's at 67 hertz. The top one's at, at 254.1, 254.1. And uh, the reason for that is uh, a good voice uh, system will only pass um, the frequencies between 300 hertz and 3 kilohertz, because that's where your voice energy is. So these all fall below the 300 hertz, so you can filter it out of the audio getting transmitted out to the repeater, but it still makes it into the receiver, um, and, and you end up not hearing it. Okay, that's why it's part of the reason it's subaudible. It's also fairly low in frequency and fairly low in amplitude. Okay, so once again, if you have a Baofeng, you go to transmit continuous tone coded squelch. Uh, we'll use the 88.5 hertz. This is all documented in your repeater guide. Um, so you, you should have uh, knowledge of what repeaters uh, use this. Not all repeaters use it. Uh, some do and some don't. Um, so how do you know if it's set? Once again, if the, uh, if the Baofeng, on the Baofeng, there's no indication if you're receiving uh, but if you see the CT when you're transmitting, then you know that your, uh, your tone squelch is set. So setting, setting this setting will never inhibit you from hearing anything. It only affects, it only just adds this little bit of audio to your outgoing signal. Uh, so everything coming into you is still, uh, still going to make it okay. Um, so here's, the, here's the, the first peril I call for tone squelch, and that is most modern HTs let you set it on receive as well. And so it acts the same way as the repeater did. In other words, if you set it on receive and that tone isn't on the audio coming into your HT, you're not going to hear anything. You could be standing right next to the person and it's not going to come out. Um, it's a clever, powerful feature. People that go to Dayton and things like that that want to sort of set up and not have to listen to a lot of chatter and there's a lot of hams in the area might set it up on simplex frequencies. but in terms of emergency deployments and things like that, in general operation, uh, you don't really ever want to set this because it can only hurt. <laughs> if you don't set it, the worst thing that will happen is you'll hear more than you want to. If you do set it uh, and it's not appropriate, then you won't hear anything. So I'd rather hear a little more than not hear anything. Um, so this is often the answer to why isn't this thing working. A lot of folks come out to an activity and they try to finger in the, all the programming on their radio, and they hit tone squelch, and it's a little bit obscure whether you're doing transmit or receive. Uh, each radio calls it something slightly different. Um, so if you, if you don't study ahead of time, it's very easy to accidentally put this in. So this is kind of what the circuit in your radio uh, is doing. If it doesn't hear that tone, the audio doesn't get to the speaker on your radio. Okay, so on the Baofeng radio, if you see the CT on receive, bad, bad, get that thing turned off. Um, there's also another uh, tone squelch peril, and that is uh, there's something called digital, code, digital coded squelch, uh, which uses not a continuous tone, but kind of a series of of bits uh, that are encoded in tones uh, to enable it. So you can accidentally set that as well. Uh, pretty much every HT supports this. I've only, I've been a hand a long time and I think I've seen one repeater that actually uses it. And it was really cool because I enabled it and it, it worked. <laughs> but uh, I don't, are there any repeaters in the area that have DCS in this area? No. Okay. Birds are pretty popular in Europe though. Yeah, it could be, it could be. So. Uh, DCS is probably not appropriate for use around here. But once again, read your manual. Read up on your radio and see what it can do. It can do an awful lot of stuff, some of which you don't want it to do, right? Uh, so once again, the, uh, the Baofeng, uh, you go into the menus and you turn off receive CTCS. 
you uh, may or may not turn on transmit DC, uh, or excuse me, turn off transmit DCS uh, and turn off receive DCS. So, um, by the way, if you're using a repeater that doesn't need a tone and you have tone turned on on your transmitter, nobody will know the difference. <laughs> okay, so it's it's kind of a um, it, it it can do no harm to have the tone turned on and transmit. But it can do a lot of harm. We have it turned on and receive. So uh, you're probably now saying, "Well, how does this thing ever work?" You know, with all this stuff going on, um, it's not as easy as a cell phone. Like I mentioned, the thing that makes us special as hams is that uh, we're non-commercial, licensed service that maintains our own infrastructure. We don't pay uh, Verizon or AT&T to put up repeaters for us. We maintain them ourselves. Uh, we configure our radios to work with them ourselves. And we don't depend on others, which really makes us unique, especially in, in emergencies. But you need to study a little bit in order to, to use it as a result. Um, radio programming software, highly recommended. You'll probably see examples of it tonight. Is that true? Yep. Um, almost all modern radios, even the cheap ones, uh, can be set up using a computer. Um, do your research ahead of time. Go through the repeater directory. Punch this stuff in. It looks like a, punching it into a spreadsheet. You can set, put all these settings in and then download them to your radio. And now you just select a channel and that all the stuff, uh, all the appropriate settings for that repeater are there. So this radio here has over a thousand memories in it. And the buttons are really small and the display is really hard to read. This is just the first 62 of those thousand channels, okay? I don't have them all programmed, but I have an, a surprising number of them programmed because I travel. And I'll put in a different set of channels for every area that I go to. Um, but this is what it looks like. It looks like an Excel spreadsheet, behaves a lot like an Excel spreadsheet. And um, you can re do your research ahead of time if you're traveling to another city. Get a repeater directory or get online. Uh, with some of the online repeater uh, directory services. And you can pre-program your radio so when you get there, you can try the different repeaters uh, in that area. So highly recommended. Um, there are freeware solutions for almost all radios, uh, or you can pay, uh, I think RT Systems is probably the most popular. Um, uh, and, and I don't know how they're staying in business now because this software called, uh, is it CHIP? Chirp. Okay, it's Chirp. <laughs> um, and um, it's, it's freeware, and they've got almost every radio uh, supported. So the, then, then all you need is the right kind of cable. A lot of these radios now have USB interfaces on them that look like serial ports. Sometimes you need a little bit of an adapter with the right plug. Get that cable, get the software, whether you pay for it or whether you uh, download it for free. Okay, so how do you keep from messing up the, the field? Know your radio. <laughs> if you're reading the manual out on site, you probably haven't re prepared properly. Um, you, still have it with you, on site. you should still have it with you on site, but boy, if you bring it out, you're, it's, it's probably a last resort um, because a lot of them are really hard to read and they never really answer the question you're looking for, <laughs> it seems anyway. Uh, Figure things out on your own. Fool with the radio at home. Try to you know get you know spend twenty bucks. Get a Baofeng, and get to set one up like it's a repeater and the other one up like it's you, and see if you can get things to work uh, between the two radios. Also, know the operating plan. Anytime you go to a public service event or an emergency drill, someone should put out an operating plan that includes the frequencies and repeaters, tone settings that you're going to use. Um, Charge your batteries before you need them, okay? One thing that uh, I, I learned from a buddy of mine in the Loudon Group is to get a, a power strip like this and um, put, a, put a charger in there. You don't want to leave the battery. A lot of people say it's bad to leave batteries on a charger all the time. It's probably not as bad as it used to be. But he just sets it so it comes on for four hours every Sunday night. He puts one of these timers on it. So it, it keeps the batteries... Uh, uh, up to snuff without overcharging them. And uh, it's, it's actually a really good idea. And get a spare battery. Um, sometimes the batteries cost more than the radios, but 
um, it's not bad to have a spare. I'm sorry, clamshell, I'm not familiar with that term. It's a container for AAA batteries. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's good. Be aware, though, that most of the time when you do that, it, your radio will operate at reduced power. Uh, what, what he was saying is you can get something that looks like a battery pack, but it pops open and you can, you can just put AAA cells or AA cells depending on the... Uh, uh, but it's, if your battery's dead, it's better than nothing because you can grab some AA cells and put it in there. Study ahead and prepare. So, okay, I'm just going to do a quick review. I have two checklists. I have the the checklist and I have the do checklist, okay? So this is the duh checklist. This is sort of the basic stuff. Um, turned on, battery charged. Is the battery installed correctly? Okay, There's, they're all different on how they snap in uh, and have you set the correct frequency. Then the more subtle ones... Uh, um, the dough checklist. Okay. Repeater offset. Is the repeater offset in the right direction? Is it a plus or a minus? Have you set any uh, necessary transmit tone? Uh, and do you have the correct tone frequency? And have you accidentally turned on tone squelch or DCS, uh, which cripples your receiver? All right. This I put up here because uh, in the uh, incident management system, there's an ICS-205, which is a standard uh, way of putting a comm plan out uh, in emergency situations. If It's not bad to use for public service events, too. If you get used to using it, then if you get called in, uh, as if you're an ARIES member and you get called into the EOC or you get called into a drill, I mean, it's not just for hams to use. This is also for public service frequencies. So know how to read it. Uh, and get the information you want. For instance, uh, this is the logistics net, um, and uh, the receive frequency is 146.64. This is the repeater that we did. Receive tones, none. No receive tones. Transmit is 146.04, and the transmit tone is 100, uh, 100 hertz, and it's an analog uh, repeater, okay? So get, get used to uh, seeing these. If, if somebody's organizing an event and they don't publish this, ask for one. It'll help, help everybody, not just you. Uh, I don't know. I think that's it. So the more you know, the more fun it is. All right. Yeah.